Welcome again. This is Dr. Greg for Off the Couch, where psychology meets everyday life. I'm here with producer Brian Gomez. Hey. Happy Happy Monday, you guys. And also, there's Gus on engineering. Hi, Gus. Hi. Good to see you. Um, So today on Off the Couch, we're going to talk about what women want. And I'm not going to try to mansplain you. We have a great survey that kind of goes over this. What voices turn us on? Making an irresistible dating profile. And we're going to answer the question, does marriage really make you happy? And then we're going to talk in psychology in the news. We're going to talk about making memory better or making better memories, I guess. Either way, Brian, what do women want? What do you think? Oh, that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> well, that's exactly it. We we don't try to figure it out for ourselves. And instead, another researcher turned me on to this great survey that we've talked about a little bit before here, which is the Ideal Partner Survey. And this wasn't recently released. You know, I try to keep my research as, as current as possible, but this was a momentous uh, creation. And it's called the Ideal Partner Survey. This is a collaboration um, with a an app called Clue, which is a menstrual tracking app used by 12 million people around the world. And the University of Gothenburg and researcher Tanya Gerlach in Germany and My One Condoms. And they surveyed more than 68,000 people in 180 countries to find out the answers of basically what women want. And in fact, I'm only going to go over the top line surveys. If you click on, if you go to YouTube and you click on the link, you look at the article and then you can go through there and get a PDF of the entire research study. It is unbelievable what they found but these we found some really cool things so let's go to the first one which is which trait are women looking for which trait we talked about it last week brian do you remember it was kindness kindness yes 88.9 percent well we should just say 89 percent of women said they are that's a very important trait that they're looking for in a partner 86.5 percent said supportiveness 72.3% said intelligence, 64.5% said education, and 60.2% said confidence. These sound like pretty good things. I think so. Yeah, I think especially kindness and support. Kindness and support. If you can think in terms of that. Intelligence, we can't always do something with. I mean, you're kind of born with what you're born with. You can maybe kind of sharpen it up a bit. And it's good to be intellectually curious. And that that is very, very attractive to someone who's already intelligent. But I think people often match their intelligence uh, in relationships, although there there might be some glaring exceptions. Um, Education's another controllable but somewhat you know it's only for people who it's available to so you know education is something you can actually go out and get confidence is something you can build and work on but kindness and supportiveness those are those are pretty basic traits that we all need to continually work on in this world in question do you think that they're wanting the kindness to be the top because it's there's a lack of kindness in the world or do you think it's (sighs) You know what? I don't think so. In fact, I always noted, especially when I was young, and I didn't call it kindness. I call it nice. I go, I'd really get kind of turned on by people who were nice. Oh, maybe that is, Brian, because I didn't think that everyone was nice. People are just cold. We live in L.A. and I lived in New York. People can be cold in those cities, and uh, whenever someone was nice, it just really kind of warmed my heart and drew me toward that person, and that I think that was kindness I was looking at. But it's almost like a shock that we're kind of like shocked that some people are kindness. Yeah. When we see the kindness, it's not such a common sense thing where we're like, oh, kindness is just roaming around us, you know? No, no, it's not just warming. And, you know, we talked before about saying hi to people on the street, that that makes people happier, um, and I try to do that, and I continually am confronted with the person who has got something that they've, they're looking at about a thousand feet in the distance and they're just staring that thing down and they are not seeing me, although they, their bodies seem to avoid me. So I think they may see me with their peripheral vision, but I don't get an acknowledgement. So 
My hello fells file falls on deaf ears. <laughs> you can keep trying. Okay, let's look at the next one. This is parenting. This found that 46% of women of all sexual orientations said that potential that uh, a potential partner's desire to parent was very important in choosing a long-term mate. So that desire to parent is, you know, that's only in about half or just a little less than half. And that is that means that, you know, a lot of other people that isn't as important. So that's kind of an interesting little fact right there. And, um, you know, it, I think parenting, though, or having children, that can be as important as anything. And that can actually make and break relationships, especially for women, I would say, because it sucks, but they have a time limit on when they can have children. Right? No, it is unfortunate. And I will tell you, as a couples therapist, though, sometimes it's the man. Oh, sometimes it's the man in a, in a heterosexual relationship. Sometimes it's the dude who wants the kids and the woman is like, uh, you know, I'm not ready or I don't really want to do that. I mean, we don't have to actually have the baby grow inside of us, so it's easier <laughs> for us to want. It's a hell of a lot easier for us. So, yes. Um, so, yeah, it can be either way. It's kind of an interesting thing. And now remember, this was done with 180 countries around the world. So the next one was very interesting to me. Let's go to the next one, which is ethnic or religious similarity. Few women, very few women, only 9.8% of women said ethnic similarity was something that was important in a long-term partner. So, you know, even though this is a lot of different countries, people are open to kind of roam. And ethnic doesn't necessarily mean racial. It can be, it, it can be you know, belonging to certain groups that aren't necessarily racial. Uh, I think a, a, an example could be Jewish uh, population, although that's a religion that also doubles as an ethnicity for some where it's more of an identity identity versus a religion and that i think that's i think that's sometimes confusing we've got race we've got ethnicity and we've got religion but going back to that slide religion was more important so religion in and of itself is more important 25.4 percent of women actually want someone who is religious um, or is similar religion and that makes a lot of sense because if you're raising kids, if you're in that, you know, 46% and you're raising kids, I, I myself was raised in a two religion household and, you know, I would start, I would start on Saturday and I would go all day Saturday, go Sunday. I would have middle of the week stuff. It just seemed like a lot. <laughs> Sounds like a lot of homework. <laughs> it was a lot. And I, you know, I've talked to people that's, you know, can be taxing on the kids and the kids will start to compare and contrast, which is exactly what I started to do. Um, so 54% said ethnicity doesn't really matter to them at all. And 35% said religious similarity is not important. But here's the one that, you know, we're talking about people who are the incels and they really looked at two things they're really looking at wanting to look a certain way and to be financially stable thinking if they look a certain way and they have they're rich they drive a maserati or whatever um that they will attract a woman but what was the best physical feature this is sixty four thousand women around the world what did they say the best physical feature before you put it up what do you think it is brian you can probably see it right here <laughs> uh, <a laughs> from there smile. yeah that is what it is so yeah let's put up that when it comes to physical features attractive smile is more important than everything else including your genitals so <laughs> dudes <laughs> work on that smile i mean it's and that just says it you know smile says welcome hello you know it means i'm your friend i'm attracted to you you're at ease with me you know like when i watch this tiktok video when i was looking at those looks what was it called looks, looks maxing? maxing oh my god those guys and they're like don't smile in in pictures this says the opposite, you know, because I, you know, this looks like a, you know, someone who's full of themselves when they're not. So. And I know for a fact, girls do look at teeth. Teeth are super important. So if you're smiling, they're going to be able to see your teeth. Oh, my God. That's a big deal breaker. If you have messed like up teeth. Horses. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah, that's you. I mean, I think actually teeth, teeth convey a lot. Let's just talk teeth for a second. Teeth 
personal hygiene, teeth, you know, caring for yourself. And it also conveys breath that, you know, if the, if the teeth are kind of rotting, you're kind of not, you're kind of afraid to get close. Maybe you don't want to kiss the person. Also, and I hate to say it, this is what one thing is teeth cost money to maintain. So that, uh, unfortunately, teeth are going to be something that people who are more fine, who have more financial advantage are going to be able to do unless they have a really good dental plan, which I, in the U.S., I don't know of that plan. <laughs> <laughs> We're still in search of it. <laughs> okay. Other physical features. This is for both heterosexual and homosexual women i you know it's kind of a weird that's what the the term that was used in the study but attractive smile and attractive eyes were the most important smile and eyes smile and eyes folks okay for heterosexual women next is an average size penis <laughs> this it is what the study said, um, considerably more desirable than a large penis for most women. Uh, but people, women who are very sexually promiscuous prefer a large penis. How about that? So if you're, if you're, if you're more on the busy side, you might prefer a large penis, but for most long-term relationships, they prefer average. And did it say in the studies, like what they consider average? I didn't, well, it might have, I didn't actually, uh, think to look up that i'm sure somebody's <laughs> wondering <laughs> you know i do try to look up certain details but i guess that one i don't know that just that seemed like okay that's cool um also women like short hair large hands an attractive back which you know i had never thought of but attractive back muscular arms and facial hair were the next most desirable so i guess you got it going on brian you got that <laughs> facial hair my hairy man and um, for lesbian, gay, bisexual uh, women, uh, average breasts, average buttocks, attractive back, and long hair in that order. How about that? We better get our backs together. <laughs> the back seems to be a big thing. Now, let's go look at financial security. Do you know, I think that's one that uh, there's a lot of insecurity around, but it is important to people. But let's look at the next slide. Where is financial security? And it's actually very important for some people, and it really varied by country. Japan, it's number one, and that kind of doesn't surprise me because Japan has gone through a long, difficult period of recession and difficulty. So 66.7% of people in Japan want to to choose financial security, 60.8% in Mexico, and USA was 59.8%, Colombia, 58.9%, but France was the lowest. France, where, you know, a lot of stuff is really taken care of and the quality of life is very high for most people, 34.0% in France. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I thought it was interesting, the USA. And then I think, oh, yeah, a lot of people worship money here. So I would have thought the USA <laughs> would be at like number one, honestly. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh oh. Well, let's go to the next one where I'm sad not to see the USA represented at all, which is education. Where does education <laughs> and very important in choosing a partner? Columbia, 82%. That's so interesting. The woman next to me, uh, next door to me is from Columbia. She's a very, very big deal dermatologist. Is, and her mother was one of the first psychiatrists in Columbia. She, uh, her mother is, unbelievable so education runs very strong in their family and so it's just kind of interesting to me um mexico 80.8 percent it's important education in brazil 80.7 percent so we're looking at these countries in south america central and south america um so it's just kind of interesting the lowest though were the uk 55.4 percent and denmark 50.2 percent how about that? I'm just still sad that the U.S. isn't up there. <laughs> well, the U.S. is in the next one, which sadly doesn't surprise me, which is political similarity. Political similarity is very important when choosing a partner. 44.2% of people like, uh, or, I'm sorry, in Brazil, it's 44.2%. USA number two, 
43.6%. So, and that doesn't surprise me because we both have kind of crazy political systems right now. We both had an attempted insurrection. They put, they put theirs down immediately. Um, ew, we didn't move quite as quickly, but yeah, they both had an attempted insurrection. They both had a populist candidate who, did some you know, messy things and then they had a, an attempted insurrection when that person didn't win re-election. I mean, it was a remarkable similarity in the two countries. So political similarity seems to be very important in those two countries. And this survey was done, I think, before either of those uprisings happened. So that's kind of interesting. Um, but the lowest is in France, which was interesting because, uh, I mean, the French love to talk politics, but I guess there's more agreement. 19.6% in France, 17.1% in Mexico. And the lowest of all doesn't surprise me, perhaps, because I, everyone kind of has to be on the same page, which is Russia at 15.5%. You don't express dissent there. And maybe that's a good sign. Maybe it's a reflection that we're, uh, maybe us and Brazil are allowed to express consent, but it's sometimes gotten to a very heated places. Okay, so that's that is what women say they want around the world. But there was another study that actually kind of that did just come out that looked at people's voices. So this is research from the Pennsylvania State University and published in the journal Psychological Science. They asked 3,100 participants across 22 countries representing five continents and New Zealand. They had them listen to these video. They, they had them listen to record. And they they did this kind of interesting thing. They had several people of different voice tones uh, record things, and then they had each of those voice tones sped up and slowed down to kind of make each voice tone, you know, to give like three different speeds of that voice tone. So they had them listening to a bunch of different voice tones, and they basically asked them you know, what did that bring up for people? And they, they asked about which voice sounded more attractive, which voice sounded more flirtatious, which sounded formidable, and which sounded prestigious. So here are the results. Women and men prefer lower pitched voices when asked the voice they would prefer for a long term relationship such as marriage. How about that? I mean, that kind of makes sense now. I'm wondering if I should lower my voice. You know, I I probably could do that, but <laughs> it might sound a little strange. Um, and I, you know, it's funny when I was like in college, uh, I remember people would comment on my voice. They would say, "Oh, your voice is very low," and I, I, I think I artificially raised it up because sometimes it it kind of bothered me that people would have issue with it. But nonetheless, it's interesting to me that. That is the case that people actually prefer sometimes a lower pitch voice. Do you think it's more soothing compared to a higher pitch voice where like after a while it would get annoying or my <laughs> 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 your head would start hurting? <laughs> sometimes I feel like my voice is a little bit like a meditation tape. Like I try not to be that way, but. Uh, you do have a soothing voice. It, it, nice. Yeah. And I, you know, it's not like Larry King, you know, like he, he's, his more cuts through. Mine's more like, you know, you feel relaxed, but which is good doing therapy, let me tell you, but I'm not so, oh, that's so true. sure about a lot of things. <laughs> so lower male uh, voice pitch made the individual sounds sound more formidable, especially or lo among younger men. So people be like, oh, my goodness, and more prestigious among older men. How about that? Perceptions of formidability and prestige had a larger impact in societies with relationship relational mobility. Let's talk. So it's going to have more of an impact where you're constantly meeting new people and constantly intersecting with people. So in a small town or a small society or place like a workplace where you see the same people every day, it's not going to have that same impact. It's just not going to matter as much, but it seems to matter more when there's more intersection, when you have, when you interact more with strangers and when there's more violence in the culture. So how about that? I just thought that was an interesting finding. 
Um, so why in violent societies? They they thought, the researchers say, that a low-pitched voice exaggerates size, makes you seem bigger. It makes a person or a non-human primate seem bigger and more intimidating, and they likened it to Death Vader, uh, Darth Vader, excuse me, <clears throat> oh, every Star Wars person is is probably kicking at the, the speaker, a Darth Vader in Star Wars. So, yeah, he talked. That was, um, that, that was, um, oh, that actor's name he was amazing he had the most brilliant voice you don't remember no, oh, i'm not man. a star Wars i'll think fan. about it well i mean this guy is just incredible yeah anyway um and then beards also counted in some societies but not all but not all so what about women's voices men perceived females with higher pitched voices as more attractive for sh- for short term relationships how about that (laughs) so if you talk like a baby you know if you're very high-pitched voice it's it's going to attract someone but maybe just for a date or two um sounding flirtatious and it's more attractive to men they think that's more of an attractive thing but in more stable lower relational mobility societies how about that the more stable societies women perceive flirtatious voices as a threat to their existing social networks how about that that's interesting because i'm watching feud on hulu and it's the second season and it's truman capote versus the swans and all the women they are they're formidable like these women are all beautiful very wealthy and they all formidable and they all have they're just strong women with strong voices um they they don't appear uh flirtatious at all i mean or you know they can be i'm sure but they're they're like you you feel their strength coming across on the screen so just kind of interesting sociocultural variables such as higher relational mobility so if you've got, if people are moving around all the time, it's less direct information about your competitors. So you, you know, people are moving around all the time. You don't know what's up. So you don't know what's going on where you live in a small society. You know what's going on with people. So people are more attentive to easily identifiable characteristics, characteristics such as voice pitch. So if you live in a small town, don't worry about it. Like be yourself. You're cool. If you if you live in a big city like New York or maybe even L.A., change everything. No, you know what? <laughs> Just be yourself. Get to know the people you get to know. Be in the groups you want to be with. Join a club. Join a workplace. Be amongst the people who your people. Don't try to be something you're not. I just don't believe that's good. Okay, now, you know, the study from we talked about before when the University of Washington in St. Louis, uh, we talked about four purpose categories and dating profiles. Do you remember, Brian, we talked about that when you're putting an online profile, if you really want to attract others, it's not as much you want to talk about being like a hot dude and, you know, and you got a Maserati, but to say some kind of goal orientation, some kind of purpose that actually ends up attracting people a lot more. And they actually people think people are more attractive when they do this. So remember this? No? Yeah. No okay. <laughs> do you remember what they were? No? No. <laughs> okay. Oh, pro-social orientation, a goal of helping others. Relational orientation, goals of family and finding a partner. Financial orientation, goals of financial security. And creative orientation, goals focused on creativity and originality. Now I remember. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I mean, it kind of spans the globe. I mean, if you, you're into all kinds of different, if you're into one of these different things in some way, that makes you more attractive and you express that. People rated profiles higher if they shared the same purpose. So they're like, hey, I want to have family and find a partner too. That makes you more attractive to me. Um, there was one exception we talked about. I think it needs to be said again. Financial, financially focused profiles don't rate as high as the other ones, except when it's somebody else who has a financial orientation. So it's like means like on, on financial, uh, like, like meet, like, like meets like. Um, and it can be a turnoff sometimes to some other people. But here's another study about making your dating profile great. So I always used to have a rule for like my clients, I would tell them, I think you need to be specific about yourself and general about what you want. I always thought this was a good rule. What do you think? 
No. What do you mean specific? about? Well, yourself? I mean, you need to describe yourself because people sometimes in their dating profiles were vague about themselves and then would say, I'm looking for someone who's, you know, this height, this color hair, this religion, this, 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 this. And they go down a list like they have a list of things. And I, I would think that anyone reading that would go, well, even if I meet all those things, they're going to find something about me they won't like. Like, it just seems like that person doesn't like them. So, um, but now University of Chicago Booth School of Business, believe it or not, psychological research coming out of school of business. And we've talked about this before. There is strong overlap. These researchers identified something else that makes a difference, which is in your profile, if you can make the other person feel known. Oh, like if they can connect? Yeah. And it, this is, I think this is actually a little bit tougher than it sounds. So this was a study published in Journal of Experimental Social Psychology. And it grew from this understanding of what was called the empty vessel effect. These are people, you know, when patients go in to see their doctors, they don't want to know their doctor's having a bad day. They just, <laughs> it's like if somebody came into your office and you started dumping your if bad I day. started dumping. Sometimes people can be like, people are very attentive. They'll, they'll go, oh, um, did you sleep okay last night? And I'll be like, oh. Do I look like I didn't? Because I didn't. Um, no, it, you know, I mean, sometimes people will pick up on things. I don't even like that. I, I'm always very honest. So people ask me a question. I try to answer it. Um, but the bottom line is people generally prefer someone to not have emotions of their own so that that person can fully attend to them. Okay. This study then kind of tried to put that into online profiles. They took profiles from Match.com and Coffee Meets Bagel. Coffee Meets Bagel is one of the apps like Tinder and these others, but it's more serious. So I found that both Match.com and Coffee Meets Bagel, people tend to be more relationship-oriented in those particular venues, although maybe not always. You know, there's always crossover. Um, and they, they took these profiles and they rated these profiles as wanting to be known by a potential partner or a desire to know a potential partner. They found about 50% of the profiles wanted to be known. So these are people who are saying all kinds of stuff about themselves, which is fine. I actually generally think that's okay to say something, you know, give an idea of who you are, but only about 20% had a desire to know a potential partner. Then they asked 250 people to rate the profiles from one to seven based on how much they found them attractive and, and I think this is crucial, how much they would want to contact that person. So then they went through and rated these things and the finding was that the, the raters preferred the profile writers who emphasized wanting to know the other person. They liked, and this is a quote from the article. They said, I, uh, it's like, I really care about you and I'm going to get, get, I'm going to get to know you and be there for you and listen to you and be a great partner. That's, that's kind of the hypothetical of what's going on inside the person's head who's wanting to contact. So they want to know that from the other profile that someone will care about them, that someone will want to get to know them and be there for them and listen to them. That makes sense. And I think a good example of that is like, say, for example, you're really into music, right? Uh -huh. And you want to put on your profile that, you know, let's say, for example, this is your favorite song. And then you would want to ask whoever is the reader, like, what is your favorite current Perfect. song, you know? And that gives the connection. It yeah. gives them the chance to actually respond with something and like that they're actually going to be heard. Perfect. No, that's exactly it. You want to you want to pr to put in your profile enough that you want to know what what floats their boat, what kind of bugs them, or what kinds of things do they like to do on a Saturday, you know, or those types of things. And then also, just you don't need to give a bit. And I think when you also you contact somebody, you continue that. You continue that, you know, like, you know, oh, cool. Where'd you grow up? Well, whatever, you know, like all those basic beginning questions that can really be helpful. There is one relationship. By the way, this held not only for relationships, it seems to hold for friendships, work relationships, all kinds of relationships that you wanting to get to know somebody actually really helps the relationship quite a bit. 
So be a little less selfish, be a little more interested in somebody else. How about that? There is one exception, one exception, one relationship exception. Can you guess? No. Can you guess, Gus? With work? <laughs> it is the parent-child relationship. Ah. This one hurt me because, ah. Oh, it's what my mother says all the time. The thing that predicts relationship satisfaction with a child is not how well a child knows the parent. It's how well the parent knows the child. And this made a lot of sense to me because the one grief I get from my parents is, I didn't know that. Like, you didn't tell me that. You're doing what? Oh, this is a surprise, you know. I know how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. and you see the grief, you know, uh, and I and so this is this is an area of growth for myself. I need to continue to work on that. I and it's something I will continue to work on. I feel like we all need to work on that. There you go. So the dating profile, I, I wrote out what perhaps you can do to make a really good one. I still think being specific about yourself in general about what you want, not trying to box someone in, like leave it open, want to know more about them. You want to connect with them. Demonstrate your purpose. Are you pro-social oriented? Do you want to help improve the world? Are you relationship oriented? You want to have wife or husband and kids? Are you creative oriented where you want to create new things? You're an artist or a writer or you just you're a tech person who likes creating new things or you financially oriented where it will only attract but you've got to know it will only attract others who share that same purpose then demonstrate a desire to really get to know the other person that you want to understand them that you want to you want to get to know their world and doing all of that apparently will really help people's dating lives that and being kind and be honest about it too. Whenever you are making your dating profile or anything, you don't want to just put whatever you think is going to get you to talk to somebody or connect with somebody. If you're wanting a like serious relationship, you want it to be known. You know that way you're not misleading somebody or just trying to get into a relationship, which I feel like a lot of people fall into. You know. I've always thought there's a brains to not trying too hard, just being a great person that other people want to be around. Um, and that kind of seems to apply to dating profiles too. If you look at somebody's dating profile and you're like, gosh, this seems like a great person. I just want to hang out with them. They'd be an interesting person to get to know, even if we don't have a connection. I'd say that was a pretty good thing. So I don't know. Seem fun. Don't just put selfies only. Just show people your world in a way. I will keep that in mind. <laughs> I, well, I'll keep that in mind. So all of this adds up to, a, to another poll that came out this week that I thought was pretty great. It's basically, does marriage make one happy? And this was a Gallup poll that came out this week. And it suggests not only does marriage make people happy, it does by a long shot. This was fascinating because it was even or over other relationships, long-term relationships or domestic partner relationships that the marriage relationship itself seems to really benefit people. How about that? Well, this is according to people, you know, I mean, you, the surveys are done different ways. If you ask people their opinion, that's one piece of information. And then you can look at other ways of measuring it too. But this was a Gallup poll that asked people their opinion. The survey spanned 2009 to 2023. They looked at 2.5 million American adults. I mean, this is a huge sample size. And then they asked, I thought this was pretty great. How do you rate your life? They had zero is the worst rating and 10 is the highest rating. What would you say yours? What would you do? Mine? Yeah. Um, like my life overall? Yeah. Zero to ten. Ten being the best. Probably like a good eight. Yeah. Like yeah. it could be better, but like I'm so grateful and happy. I feel pretty good too. I, you know, I, I would definitely put myself there. I, I never like to overemphasize, so I would probably mark it down to a seven, maybe a seven five. Seven five seems good. Seven five it, seems, it's not, yeah. It's not like I'm bragging. 
But yeah, and but you know, we all have down times. We all have a four going on, and then sometimes we have really great times. You know, sometimes it feels like a zero. Sometimes it feels <laughs> like a zero. <laughs> so people were asked to rate their own lives, and then respondents were asked to predict their happiness in five years. This is interesting, and since I already know what the prediction is, I'm not going to do it. But Brian, what would you say the prediction? What's your prediction in five years? Yeah, you can't look at the. I didn't put it here. <laughs> My the answer is not here. Of my own or? <laughs> yeah. You probably just saw it. No. <laughs> I don't know. Well, you don't have to do it. So it's what? No, go ahead. No, say it. No, I don't know. Just guess. Generally, you know, I always think it's going to be about the same. So if to be considered thriving, which is a word I always consider kind of a funny word, thriving. I'm not, I'm not just living i'm thriving it's like i feel like it's a plant pushing through the earth but um people to be considered thriving people had to rank their present life as seven or higher which i guess we both did but their future life as eight or higher so they had to have somewhat of an optimistic orientation and married people consistently reported higher levels of happiness how about Aww. that? Ranging from 12 to 24% higher, depending on the year. Um, and the, the concept of commitment is what the researchers really believe is at the bottom of this. The, the people are bonded with one another because marriage is a legal contract. People are not just there. And also part of the legal contract is the family witnessed it. The family is a part of it that, you know, you might own property together or live in a place together. You're building a life together. Maybe you have a child together. There are lots of ties together that really make the relationship go in a different direction. So that bond really helps. And it's also knowing someone who's consistent, who's safe, who's secure, and they're a home base to help support you in case of adversity. I mean, that makes sense. Life seems to be a little easier when you have a partner helping you through life. I think so. And it, just knowing someone is there to come home and complain to, to me, is a pretty good thing. Observations. Bradford Wilcox of the National Marriage Project at the University of Virginia said things like race, age, gender, and education matter, but marriage seems to matter more. That's what comes out on top. Therapist Ian Kerner, I thought this was the most interesting quote he told CNN. Um, that he sees a shift in our culture from romantic marriage to compassionate marriage. How about this? So people are not just getting married because they fall in love with someone, but someone they feel like they can build a life with. So like someone who can be a best friend over a passion partner. That makes sense. I mean, with marrying a best friend, I think life is just a lot more fun. Yes, I think that can be very much the case. Um, and I think the best relationships I observe are relationships that do transition to best friends. Um, and it, th remember, we talked about self-compassion, that it not only improves yourself, but it improves your relationship, too. So there's something about having compassion for oneself and one uh, and one's partner that will actually build a s stronger relationship. I think that's pretty wonderful. But what if the marriage is unhappy? Will they be happier? <laughs> no, I highly doubt it. I probably, think it just goes down. Probably from worse there. than being single. So that yeah, if the marriage is unhappy, it's time to work on it. The thing about marriages is I I we could go all day about marriages. They I think are an extremely important and important, important topic. It, it, marriages follow certain patterns and you you actually see these i think john and julie gottman researchers up at the university of washington and in, in uh washington <laughs> in washington state um they actually um have some fascinating data sets spanning decades um and they really the premier on top and they looked at all these different things and one day we'll talk about their model because i actually use their model and find it quite compelling they look at all these positive variables as well as negative variables the negative variables are very interesting because once you get into this place of arguing and you start to 
um, pull deficits in the relationship, it can really put a strain on relationships. They found that a five to one good to bad ratio in a relationship actually keeps the relationship humming along pretty nicely. It's like I tell people they're always putting money in that emotional bank because something's always going to be withdrawn. Somebody will forget someone's, you know, uh, promotion at work or they'll forget you know, to do something for somebody and you get kind of pissed at them or they forget to call the repairman, you know, or something like that. So, yeah, we all have those things happen, but you you have these withdrawals in the relationship. But as long as you have enough um, extra in there, it's going to really help and it's going to really keep things going. They found that the pre- biggest pro- problem relationships are things that kind of are a one-to-one. So if it's a good and bad thing, good and bad thing. And they found that people that break up, it goes to 0.8 good to one bad. So the minute the scale tips, it's going to be bad. And I think it was Lenore Walker at the, uh, what university, Florida, FEFA? No, a, a university in Florida, Nova, I think. Um, she is a researcher in domestic violence, but she actually has a, a very good saying that a relationship doesn't break up until the bad outweighs the good. And then that's basically it. So if you're in an unhappy relationship, there's plenty to do to improve that ratio and to make things better. And I think that can really help. Okay. Psychology in the news, uh, we're going to talk about memory because that's, you even laughed about that outside because um, that's been a big piece of news and I felt like I had to talk about it. So the memories um, of presidential candidates have been called into questions um, with the latest being President Biden and there was a special counsel report. And I, I was expressing to you outside that this kind of annoyed me because you don't make a memory assessment. If you're not the person's physician, you're not the person's doctor or psychologist or doing a memory assessment. And there's a way you do a memory assessment. Um, It's not by asking questions and putting someone in an emotional hotspot, you know, during during an attorney interview. So I actually thought that was bad. He can say someone says they don't remember things. We all see all these politicians always have this favorite phrase. They say, I do not recall. (laughs) But. That doesn't mean they necessarily have a bad memory. It can mean that they just are evading answering, or it could mean that they just didn't say the, you know, they don't, they don't have full memory of the thing. So they just kind of wipe it. And I mean, it's not like none of us have ever not forgotten anything. Right. But that was just, no, exactly. Are you kidding? I forget things all the time. What's your name? I don't know. <laughs> your cell phone. <laughs> he locked myself out the other day. You know? Oh, we all do that. We all leave keys, cell phone. I've done, I've done every, any problem you can imagine. I've done it. I just don't have time to list them all. So I saw an article in the New York Times entitled, A Leading Memory Researcher Explains How to Make Precious Memories Last. I think this was a total coincidence because this man, professor of psychology and neuroscience at UC Davis, his name is Charan Ranganath. Um, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. Um, and he wrote a book that's just released called Why We, we Remember. I have to get this book because he's just uh, the interview was just so charming and wonderful to read. He just sounds like a great guy. And I'm sure he writes the same. It illustrates rather than being photo accurate repositories of past experiences, memories are more like these, you know, it's a it's a function in the brain that's happening all the time. So we always think that you remember you remember things like a videotape and that isn't it at all. And he, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, but he says memory is more a function of active interpreters working to help us navigate present and future. So it's like these things in there that are kind of going, oh, you know, these facts happened in the past. We're going to put them together this way. And based on this experience and this, then we predict this or to help you. And he gave kind of an interesting example. That was with um, Starbucks. You go into Starbucks, you stand in line, and then you get up to the front, you order, the person says it'll be this much money, you give your money, and then you wait, and they hand you your coffee. 
And he said, all of that is based on an illusion. And I love this because it's basically you predicted that by waiting in line and you, you've done this before, that when you get to the front, that once again, they'll take your order. Once again, they'll take your money. And once again, they'll hand you coffee rather than you them picking up the coffee and throwing it in your face, which could actually happen. Next time I'm in Starbucks, I'll actually think of that example. But the reality is that actually giving people um, – it, it's, an, it's an illusion that we're kind of walking through. We're constantly predicting things based on past. And he talked about two types of memory, which is this – I mean, there are just many types of memory, but I'm, gl- I'm just going to keep to the article. Episodic memory, memory for life experiences. So it's kind of, you know, how we piece things together, like how the kind of how we tell the story, the narrative. And semantic memory, which is memory of facts and knowledge about the world. Like you were wearing a green sweater. I remember it was 4 o'clock, you know, <laughs> or, you know, those types of things, like these facts. And he said the two together. We can often remember detail that make it feel like we have a photographic memory, but it's kind of like we're we're pu- putting it all together. I think that's a little bit interesting because uh, having done a lot of reading and whatnot on things like uh, like false memory, we had that big thing anyway in the past, and I think it's quite possible because I've had that happen before, and it's just fascinating stuff. But it, anyway, we're, we're just trying to piece things together. I always ca- tell my clients, it's kind of like you got all these files in your head, and your brain goes and tries to grab a file and get the information out, and it tries to put it all together, and it's happening very quickly, and sometimes there can be errors. So we don't necessarily, re- he said, we don't replay the past as it happened. We do it through a lens of interpretation and imagination. How about Mm -hmm. that? So it's kind of interesting, too, because as a cognitive psychologist, I work with people on identifying things like their cognitive errors and biases. We also talk about the way they view the world. We talk about core beliefs, which is sort of the lens through a filter through which they put information. We also talk about assumptions about the world. That's kind of like going to a Starbucks and assuming they're going to hand you some coffee at the end of that whole thing. And that those assumptions sometimes can be based on a false premise. So we talk about all those things, and this definitely intersects with memory. It might be a little bit highfalutin for this for this discussion, but nonetheless, he talks that they give us an illusion of stability in a world that's always changing. He said our identities are built on a pile of sand. <laughs> Basically, we kind of have this belief about ourselves, and things are always shifting and changing. But we, we think the world's a little bit more stable than maybe it always is. I thought that was kind of cool and just kind of a cool like thing to think about, even though it doesn't really change much in our world. We reshape memories into our beliefs about what is happening right now, and we're biased about how we sample the past. This made a lot of sense to me because we remember what we want to remember. And he talked about his own experience, like being last to be kicked picked (laughs) maybe he was last kicked that would be good but no he was last to be picked on a sports team and how he was an immigrant child and all of that played into his identity um that he he goes even you know he's this extremely prominent neuroscientist that he said sometimes when things go wrong he still goes back to that old self oh yeah And I think all of us, every single one of us have that. I certainly do. I have that child inside myself. So I wanted to also say a word about aging and forgetting names, because I think we had this on an earlier podcast with Zoe when when she was here and she was saying she forgets names. And I said, oh, proper noun forgetfulness is natural with age, completely natural. We forget names, you know, like that person in that film. I can't remember. I did it earlier with James Earl. No, no. I What's his name? Star Wars. Yeah, right. Star Wars. Yeah, there's someone at home. Anyway, he's he is an incredible actor. Um and I can't believe I'm forgetting his name. How funny, because I, I actually was thinking, oh, I can rem- I'll remember that actor's name. I didn't even think I needed to write it down. But of course I forget, because this is when our, my mind is going for it, and that file's like going, oh, no, over there, or it's under a pile. Um, but it's natural with age. So, But accumulated memory and knowledge becomes wisdom. This is what's so fascinating to me, is you don't need to remember that you can actually put facts together, and people who are older can make better decisions. 
which I think is a, is an advantage, and that's what we often associate with wisdom. We're designed to extract meaning from the past, which in, past, and that includes wisdom. Like we, when we take that meaning and we kind of put it together accurately, that's that becomes wisdom. So op- older people may not remember names as easily, but their decision making, especially around things in which they have accumulated experience, is superior to younger people who are great with names. Like life lessons, then. Yeah, because right? life lessons. Yeah. So it's that you remember the Oracle in oh, the yeah. Matrix, you know? She was just exuded wisdom. But would she have been the same character if she was like a 16 year old? Oh, no. I don't you even know? think they would have had her as the Oracle. No, it's no. what was so fascinating is her wisdom, her deep voice, her presence. You were just like, ah, oh, she was the perfect person to be cast in that role. I wanted to go to her. <laughs> <laughs> so, this memory researcher also said something that I often say to people too, to increase memory, increase your attention. Increase your attention. Inattention is the biggest reason we forget and we have memory problems. Um, it is our biggest memory interference. A good example is the phone. It's the biggest distraction. He recommends turning off alerts. Don't check emails unless you're alone. Don't do things in front of other people because all it does is distract you. Um, and we can, we could even, if we had more time, we'd talk about the pandemic and all that because all that sameness caused people to be distracted. Um, also being being mindful, being being aware of sights, sounds, smells, feelings, songs, everything, like really focusing on the moment will be able to have you remember it, take the moment in fully and stop mindlessly taking pictures. They have a whole discussion, which I absolutely love going to a concert. Keep your phone in your pocket. Take pictures before or during the encore. Focus on the meaningful moments versus trying to record events. He even said, do this on vacation. And I'll never forget a guy I met on vacation, and he never had a camera with him. And I said, I noticed you don't take any pictures. And he said, yeah, I made a decision. I'm going to be fully present wherever I go. And that had a lasting impact because that was probably 20 years ago. Lasting impact on me. And I do still take pictures and I love them because it does bring back the memory. Um, But I also try to keep it in my pocket so I can experience the moment as well. I do it very quickly. I'm like, all right, if we're doing this very quick, pop, pop, and a quick video, and then enjoy the moment. You there know? you go. There you go. Well, that's it for today. So that wraps up the show. This is Dr. Greg Kason, Brian Gomez, and Gus bidding you farewell. Until next time, be present, be flexible, and be kind.